from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello, I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Make sure to download our ministry app for your smartphone or mobile device, where you can watch all of our programs and access all sort of great biblical content. Just visit the App Store for your device and search for D. James Kennedy Ministries. We often talk about God's mandate for us to live out our faith in the world. We were commissioned by His Son to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Doing so is not an easy task, but He has equipped us to be His witnesses in the world. You might hear that phrase, be His witnesses, quite often, but what does it really look like? Being His witness mainly means two things, knowing Christ and sharing that knowledge with others. Jesus paints the picture for us when describing his followers as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That, of course, raises the question, how are we to live as salt and light in a culture that has continually been turning away from God? Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, Salt and Light. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Matthew 5, we shall begin our reading with the tenth verse. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And may God speak to us today through this his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Our Savior said, Ye are the salt of the earth, ye are the light of the world. Salt and light, twin qualities that every Christian should have, and in fact, at least to some degree, every Christian does have. Today I'd like to focus our attention on the first of those, the fact that we are to be the salt of the earth. Well, it used to be said that if a person was the salt of the earth, that meant he was a real fine person, four square. But even square has come to have a different meaning, and Christians are often called other things than the salt of the earth today. How often do we think about the fact that we are supposed to be that very thing, the salt of the earth? Are you salt in this corrupting world? One writer said that humanity is a decaying carcass awaiting the vultures of judgment. Not bad, indeed, because certainly that it is. And uh, we are to be the salt that is to prevent 
that decay, that decomposition, that corruption, that death that is creeping over the world and over this nation. And obviously, the first thing that salt does, which would have been much more obvious to those ancient fishermen beside the Sea of Galilee than it is to us since the advent of refrigeration, which is mostly used today for preservative, but in that day, it was salt, which was almost the only preservative that they had. Those fishermen that caught their fish in the Sea of Galilee and shipped many of them to Samaria, to Jerusalem, knew that without salt their fish would be spoiled before they ever got to market, especially in those hot temperatures in Israel. They understood clearly what was meant by the illusion. That metaphor did not fall on deaf ears. No doubt they were astonished that they would be the salt of the earth. And so salt was exceedingly valuable because of that. Do you know at some places and times in history, salt has been used for money? Did you ever hear of a man who was worth his salt? It's also been used in some cultures as gifts. You got salt for your birthday because it was rare. However, for salt to preserve any meat from corruption, it must have direct contact. The modern word is involvement. But today, there are many Christians that have little involvement with the corrupting meat of this world. Uh, We have our own churches, our own schools, our own societies, our own sports teams, our own health insurance, our, our own fellowship groups, our own everything, and sometimes it's just almost impossible to get the salt out of the salt shaker. It's so comfy in here. And by the way, who wants to get rubbed all over that rotten, rotting meat anyway? And so that direct contact is often avoided as much as possible. How much, dear friend, are you acting as a preservative for this society? You could do far more than you imagine. You could change many things in this society if you would just sprinkle some of that salt upon some of that decaying meat. Let your voice be heard. Don't be afraid. We can have an influence a preservative influence everywhere we go. I've always appreciated that story I once read about General Robert E. Lee, who though he had a blind spot, not uncommon in his day, about slavery, was nevertheless a Christian man and a gentleman. And one day a number of the people were standing around in a circle, they were talking in a large circle, and one of the men said, I heard a good joke the other day. And then he looked around, said, I just wanted to make sure there were no ladies present. And Robert E. Lee said, Sir, I would remind you there are gentlemen present. You think that joke was told? No way. Someone says, I heard a funny story the other day. Want to hear it? Sure, I love clean jokes. That'll be salt. If they haven't got one, you tell one. Because you see, another quality about salt is it not only preserves, but also it stings. Rub some salt into a wound. Ouch, that hurts. And in a society that is filled with wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they don't always welcome salt, as I have discovered again just this week. In fact, they can be positively offended by it. And that, of course, is something that goes with the territory of being a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Billy Sunday, who was the Billy Graham of 50 years or so ago, maybe 75, preached boldly against sin and immorality in his day. And one man came to him and said, Mr. Sunday, you rub the fur the wrong way. He said, no, I don't. Let the cat turn around. And I've always been impressed by the fact that after waiting hundreds of billions of trillions of eons of time, all during which God knew and Christ knew that one day he would be coming into this world and that God himself would come to speak to his creatures. And no doubt he had given much thought to what he would say. And so when he appeared... What was the first thing that Jesus said, having pondered it for trillions of eons? He said, turn. He said, let the cat turn around. That's a loose translation of the Greek. The word is metanoia, and it means repent. Turn around. The first thing Jesus said was, repent and believe the gospel. For except a man repent, he said later, except he repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And so salt does irritate. It does sting. But nevertheless, we are called upon to be that salt. Not only am I but you are as well. Jesus didn't call us to be the sugar of the world. He called us to be the salt of the earth. And I want to tell you something. I would much prefer to be the sugar of the world. I would be delighted to have all men think well of me. And I want you to know that I don't like it when people carry signs and say that I'm a Nazi and a hate monger and a fascist and a Khomeini and all sorts of other lies. I don't like it when the newspapers print nasty things about me. I really don't like that at all. Would you? I would much rather be Uncle Sugar Daddy. And everybody would love me. But woe unto you when all men speak well of you, said Jesus. For so spake they of the false prophets which were before you. But blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. May I ask you, How much persecution for Christ's sake have you endured? For Christ's sake have you endured? Oh, we all endure some persecution because we are offensive, because we are obnoxious, and that should not be. But how much persecution do we endure for Christ's sake? The Bible says, all that, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, said Christ. By the way, we're also not called to be the vinegar of the world. Neither the sugar nor the vinegar, but we're called to be salt. Because salt not only stings, it also purifies and cures and heals. Nothing like hot salt water for a bad throat, as every speaker and singer knows, and many others as well. We should be the healing balm, and salt is that. And if we have those qualities in us that Christ would have put there, as he said in the first part of this fifth chapter, where he's described all the virtues and qualities of the Christian life, then 
we will be a healing balm to others. And people will come to us. Have you ever noticed how there's so many people that will revile Christians and they will say all manner of evil against them falsely until they get into trouble? And then where do they go? So many of them will come to a Christian, the only person they know that prays, and ask them to pray for them. Ask them if they can help because they know they've seen somebody who has received help himself, whose life has been cured and healed by Christ, and they want the same sort of thing. No, we're not the vinegar of the world because also something that salt does as well is it seasons things. It gives zest and tang and flavor to life. And so ought we to. We're not called upon to be the wet blankets of the world, but rather we should give salt. What is salt? A young boy defined it. Salt is that stuff that tastes bad when it's not there. And that's what life is. We should have the elements of joy bubbling up in us, a smile, a laugh, happiness. Christ makes us happy. Blessed are ye, blessed are ye, blessed are they, blessed are they, said Christ. We should have love in our hearts. And ah, dear friends, the Christian is called upon to love everyone. We're to love our enemies as well. We're to love those that disagree with us. We are to love those who are in bondage to sin. The Christian indeed is called upon to hate sin, but he is ever called upon to love the sinner and to pray for him and to seek his well-being and to witness to him. Though sometime, for some astonishing reason, those sinners don't welcome that witness because it smarts, it stings, it irritates because of their wounds. But nevertheless, though we may be rejected, we are called upon to bear that kind of a positive witness for Jesus Christ. And let me say lastly that salt also makes you thirsty. You've heard the cliche, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And I've said many times that any horse you can lead to water, I can make drink. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, and I don't know a whole lot about horses. But I'm quite certain if you take a salt tablet and put it in one cheek and another one and put it in the other cheek, you just better get out of the way or you're going to get water splashed on you. <clears throat> that horse is going to get thirsty. And that's what Christians ought to do. We ought to make the world thirsty for the water of life, thirsty for the way of Christ, thirsty for righteousness and holiness and goodness, thirsty for the real thing. We've been told that Coke is the real thing. Christ is the real thing. He's the real joy, the real peace, the real love the only real thing that can fill the empty hearts of men. How many people have you made thirsty for the water of life? How many people have ever come to you and said, I don't know what it is that you've got, but whatever it is, I want it. How many times we hear just the opposite? If, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. <clears throat> I remember visiting in a home one time, a couple about 40 years of age, and, and the wife, I discovered, had accepted Christ about a year before, and the man was very clearly not a Christian at all. And we were talking along, and then he said something that I was afraid he might say. He said to me, well, you know, about a year ago, my, my wife got religion. I said, uh-oh, here it comes. <clears throat> I might as well pack up and go home. And he said, and I don't know what it is, but she has been more forgiving, and she has been more joyful, and seems to be more peaceful 
than any time in our entire marriage. And I don't know what it is, but whatever she's got, I'd like to have it. I said, praise the Lord. (laughs) Just happened to have brought some with me. Now that lady was the salt of the earth and the salt of her home as well. And that's what Christ calls all of us to be. Make people thirsty for the water of life and then give them a drink. Give them a drink of that water of life. Share with them the glad tidings, that sparkling, bubbling well of water that Christ offers to us of life everlasting. Share the good news of the gospel with them. Somebody said that too many Christians are like Arctic rivers. They're frozen at the mouth. How about you? Are you assuaging the thirst of any today? God grant to all of us that we might in truth become the salt of the earth. Lest having lost our savor, our saltiness, we become good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. May we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, let us seek Thee day by day, hour by hour. Let us immerse ourselves in Thy Word and seek Thy face in prayer that we may become more like thee. Lord, make us the salt of the earth, and may others be drawn to thee as they are made thirsty for the water of life. And grant us the courage to stand against the corruption of our time. We ask it, O Christ, in thy holy name. Amen. Did Dr. Kennedy's message today make you thirsty to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? If so, Jesus himself says, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. So you might ask, what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus died on the cross and rose again to pay the penalty for our sins. Yes, we are all sinners, but Christ died for us. And if we'll transfer our trust from our own efforts to get into heaven and place our trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, then He offers us the free gift of eternal life. If you'd like to have that assurance that you are in fact a Christian, and not just in name, but a true Christ follower, then we can go to God together in prayer right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner in my thoughts and my actions, and I repent right now and place my trust in you. Please forgive me and cleanse me from my sins so that I may live for you from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer sincerely from your heart, you've just begun the greatest adventure of your life. And to help you get started, we'd like to send you the book written by Dr. Kennedy for new believers. It's beginning again, which is precisely what you're doing. To receive your copy, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. And be sure to ask for beginning again. It's our gift to you. God bless you. As Dr. Kennedy tells us in his message, the Lord has given us the responsibility to be salt and light in our own communities. But while it might sound simple, it can be very intimidating for us to step outside of our comfort zone and be vulnerable with others. Fortunately, with God's help, it is made possible. Yet there are those who actively work to silence the Christian message. For instance, the Southern Poverty Law Center, 
which once did good work in the latter days of the civil rights movement and has now taken to labeling Bible-believing Christians among so-called hate groups. Even this very ministry has received that designation. It's part of their secular left attempt to marginalize and silence those who speak biblically on issues like sexuality and marriage. And sadly, the media and much of corporate America believes the SPLC's designations as gospel. That's why we made an important decision to file a federal lawsuit against the Southern Poverty Law Center. And we need you to stand with us. This group is doing tremendous damage and we must resist them in their attempts to officially label traditional Christianity as hate speech. Can I ask you to please consider giving a generous donation to help us with this lawsuit? The SPLC, according to their own public disclosures, has more than $300 million in assets. We cannot counter that without your help. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or you can go online to djkm.org. We also invite you to sign a petition to Representative Trey Gowdy, Chairman of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. We're asking him to hold hearings on the Southern Poverty Law Center. Their false hate designation led to a shooting at one Christian ministry by a radical homosexual activist who selected his target from the SPLC's defamatory hate map. And they've never offered a word of apology. Yet the media and sometimes even the government still often rely on their biased information. The truth must be exposed. Please help us with a generous donation to press this lawsuit against the SPLC and get your petition to Congressman Gowdy asking for hearings into their activities. You'll also be helping us continue the vital ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll free 888 888- 332-3069. Go online to djkm.org. We here at D. James Kennedy Ministries are standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. Today's program is available on DVD or audio CD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.